All right. So I always stop at a terrible spot. But on the plus side, I found my mouse charger that I've been missing for years. Okay, maybe months, but anyway. Um, so here is the diagram that we were on, talking about these nuclear columns and just getting in your mind that there's columns of nuclei in the gray matter um, that span vertical segments of spinal cord as well as columns um, in, in the white matter um, that are tracks projecting through the white matter. And these are the names of some of those columns, the named columns. So I talked about Clark's nucleus. Um, it actually contains spinocerebellar tract cells, so influencing, um, carrying proprioceptive information uh, from the lower limb um, primarily to the cerebellum. The intermediolateral cell column, or the IML, spans is the preganglionic sympathetic neurons and so they're contained in this little pokeyote lateral protrusion um, of their intermediate gray matter and that's between t1 and l2 and um, the sacral sympathetic nucleus i spoke about innervating the pelvic viscera as well as nuclei for um, scm and trapezius the nucleus of the uh, spinal accessory nerve and the phrenic nerve, C345, keeps the diaphragm alive. So you'll see these will come up again. And I'm gonna just plant a seed right now. When we talk about the outcome of spinal cord injury, which we're gonna talk about extensively because it's uh, my probably my biggest research focus historically, um, the outcome of spinal cord injury is typically considered in terms of its white matter effects, but it also depends on at level gray matter effects. So I'm just planting that seed and I'll explain much more what I mean by that. Um, I'm gonna just talk through a number of diagrams because people have, you know, there's a million diagrams of sort of the segments of the spinal cord. Um, and I wondered in grad school why I had so much difficulty with this, and it's because all of the diagrams um, are partially correct. Um, they emphasize different things and they're all a little bit wrong, okay? And so, for example, so this is, gives you a coarser division of the gray matter from dorsal to ventral. And you can see that the, the sensory nuclei reside in the dorsal horn, of course we know that, and the motor nuclei reside in the ventral horn. Somatic motor neurons are in the ventral horn proper, whereas visceral efferents reside in the intermediate gray. And of course we already saw that because we saw the preganglionic sympathetics in here from T1 to L2, and the preganglionic parasympathetics from S2 to S4. And so collectively, these are autonomic efferents in the intermediate gray. And that's what's shown on the slide in green. Um, the somatic motor efferents we know and love, and the sensory nuclei have um, similar organization. So the most superficial part territory in the dorsal horn uh, by most sources is somatic sensation. Uh, like the sensation we're ta primarily talking about today, whereas deeper layers of the dorsal horn are um, involved in visceral sensation, so interoception, which we'll talk about when we get to the autonomic nervous system. You can see many of the um, landmarks are the same that are named on this slide, like the posterior white column or the posterior funiculus, but you can also see that other things are named. So in addition to the anterior white commissure, this thin layer of white matter here on the anterior side of the dorsal horn crossing from left to right of the spinal cord. There's also a posterior gray commissure on the dorsal side. Um, now this is a similar representation and most of us are familiar with this level of flow segmentally in the nervous system. So every segment of spinal cord every horizontal segment has this sensory motor and somatic visceral distribution as we've just discussed in the gray matter 
Um, and the sensory information enters via from primary neurons that have a dendritic like specialized ending or a bare ending that projects to the periphery to a target, either somatic or visceral, a cell body in the dorsal ganglion, and an axon that projects to the dorsal horn. Um, the motor neurons, either somatic or visceral, originate in the intermediate or um, ventral gray matter and exit via the ventral root. And the, the ventral root meets um, the, the sensory and outflow um, distal to the dorsal root ganglion. And at that juncture, at this level, you have a, <clears throat> what's called a mixed spinal nerve. This is a bit of an interesting slide. I chose it just for its colors, but um, and its sort of clarity and simplicity of this situation. But this slide actually is from a paper on varicella zoster, the virus that causes chickenpox and shingles. And you can see the varicella zoster virus, these little black dots, um, show where varicella hangs out. So in this time of, we're all quite interested in viruses right now, um, the varicella hangs out dormant in the dorsal root ganglion. And so you get chicken pox as a child, you're infected and exposed to the virus. Um, it hangs out in your dorsal root ganglia dormant um, until at some point in old age, depending on whether you've been vaccinated or not, older age, I should say, um, you can have shingles. And the virus is somehow activated and because it resides in one or more dorsal root ganglia, you typically get shingles um, in the skin of one or more dermatomes, adjacent dermatomes, on one side of the body only. And so it's a weird, weird little virus. Now, the spinal cord and cross section, we saw C8. This is the section we looked at previously. And uh, the spinal cord, I don't know why I can't spotlight, but who knows? Who knows how this mouse works? No one really. Um, uh, C8, we saw previously as a representative section. Um, it, of course, the appearance of the cord changes as you move from the top of the spinal cord here at C3 to its bottom here at S4. And so the most, the most obvious change you see is the diameter of the spinal cord. Um, so the cervical spinal cord is very large and oval, and the sacrospinal cord is tiny. When I say large, I'd like you to pay attention to the actual size, right? So in your book, at actual size, I may have manipulated the size of this image, but the spinal cord is tiny. It's put the maximum diameter is the diameter of your pinky finger, and even then I think that's generous. Um, so this is a tiny, tiny structure we're dealing with. But it's largest in the cervical regions um, and smallest in the sacral region. Now, in addition to just size, the relative contributions of white and gray matter change. So um, this is a white matter or myelin stain. So the white matter is dark, the gray matter is light. Um, and you can see that in the enlargements, the gray matter is large. Right? So here at L5, for example, there's a lot of gray matter. And similarly at C5 and C8, the gray matter's kind of large. But in general, the relative amount of white matter is greatest in the cervical cord and least in the sacral cord. And that makes sense, particularly if you think about it from, um, from the perspective of the somatosensory nervous system. So uh, axons are entering and being added to the white matter all the way up the neuraxis so that by the time you get to the cervical cord the white matter in the cervical cord in the dorsal columns for example contains afferents from all levels of the spinal cord whereas white matter in the sacral columns here you can just see the tiny fasciculus gracilis at s4 contains a very um a white matter from a, a blah, 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 afferents from a very small portion of the lower limb. So relative contribution of white matter. The size and shape of the ventral horns is really important. And I sort of alluded to that already. So the big ventral horns and the enlargements, C5 and C8, 
um, and L5, L2 and L5 differ substantially from the tiny ventral horns in the thoracic region. And that's because those ventral horns really only innervate axial musculature. So they're only innervating the proximal muscles of the trunk. Um, and as such, they tend to be smaller. When there's limbs, or in the case of S4 viscera, limbs and viscera, um, represented in the ventral horns and the intermediate gray, they tend to be much larger. And finally, we have the presence of the lateral horn or the IML, this intermediate lateral cell column um, in the gray matter. So when you see the IML, here it is poking out of the side, and here it is over here in T5, a little bit more subtle, you know you're in um, between T1 and L2 because a prominent lateral horn means that you have sympathetic preganglionics in the spinal cord. So I'm just gonna keep talking through a few pictures. And I hope I'm not belaboring this for you, but people have a really hard time putting this all together visually. And I know that because I had a really hard time. Um, so in the spinal cord, we have these big anterior vertebral bodies that are ventrally located. Um, and of course, the posterior processes of the vertebrae that are dorsally positioned. And then within this giant bone, we have a very small spinal cord that sits protected and buoyant in the spinal cord meninges. Remember from 326 that the ganglia, this is the dorsal root ganglia, it's a, here it's called the spinal ganglion, um, is it, the, it exits in the intervertebral foramen. So the spinal nerve and the spinal ganglia are right there within the vertebrae. Um, and as soon as it exits the vertebral column, it gives rise to a posterior ramus of spinal nerve and an anterior ramus of spinal nerve. Now the anterior ramus um, innervates all of the limbs, so the all of the plexes, cervical, brachial, uh, <laughs> lumbar, and sacral are all um, derivatives of the anterior ramus. So most of the muscles of the body. The posterior ramus innervates solely the axial muscles. So the axial musculature. And when you look, this is a very old textbook picture, but it still works. When you look at the transverse section of this arrangement, this happens to be a cervical vertebrae, and I can tell because there's transverse foramina bilaterally. Um, you can see the dorsal bifid dorsal spinous process here. The spinal cord sitting in the middle enclosed in its meninges and a dorsal root and a ventral root that merge. Um, the dorsal root has a, you can actually see the groove here where there's a dorsal root ganglion and then they merge right here. So just as they exit the vertebral column, they merge to form a spinal nerve, which is actually really um, a short structure, which is the merger of mixed sensory and, and motor information, and then give rise to the dorsal ramus and the ventral ramus. Now, the meninges. The spinal cord meninges are a little bit different than um, the cranial meninges surrounding the brain. And there's two important differences. You can already sort of appreciate them here and maybe you already um, know about this clinically. So the spinal cord has a physiological epidural space. So there is an epidural space in the spinal cord. And that's because there's only a single layer of dura. So the periosteal dura from the cranium ends at the foramen magnum and the meningeal dura continues to surround the spinal cord. And so now, as a result rather, there is um, a true or physiological in health epidural space. It tends to be full of fat, like most of the other little spaces in our body get full of fat. Um, you can see here that there is no subdural space. So the subdural space is again, um, not physiological, only potential in the spinal cord. Uh, and there is a true subarachnoid space. 
as there is. And you can see the ligaments tethering, the denticulate ligaments tethering the spinal cord to um, the overlying dura. Oh, yes, overlying dura, good. Um, yes, the subdural space does not exist, but the epidural space does. That is the important distinction. And we're gonna talk very simply about the blood supply of the spinal cord. And so as I alluded to already, there are two posterior spinal arteries and one anterior spinal artery that lie in grooves on the surface of the cord. And each of these has branches that go into the parenchyma of the spinal cord to supply it with blood. Now how this works is the aorta, this is a very schematized picture, lies ventral, not only to the spinal cord, but to the spine. And it gives rise to segmental arteries at every segment of the cord, which in turn give rise to anterior and posterior radicular arteries. And those merge to create a long continuous spinal artery. And so it's segmentally feed, fed into um, and created by these segmental branches. Um, here is, I thought I had a better picture of what it actually looks like. Oh, I do in a minute. Okay. Um, so when you look at the important part, depending on how much detail you want to remember from this, it's shown a bit better here. So the anterior spinal artery you can see is continuously fed by radicular arteries that arise at every level. Whoops, sorry, I'll start again. Um, the anterior spinal artery is fed by these radicular arteries. The aorta is not shown here. So this is a segmental artery, and this is a segmental artery. It gives rise to radicular arteries that in turn feed the anterior spinal artery. The there is communication between anterior and posterior spinal arteries. So there is some redundancy in the system, but most sources describe the territory as a two thirds, one third split. So this single large anterior spinal artery supplies the posterior two, pardon me, anterior two thirds of the cord and the two posterior spinal arteries supply this posterior wedge or third of the cord. And so th most sources describe it like this, um, a single posterior spinal artery supplies a single side of the posterior cord. And that includes some or most of the posterior dorsal horn, of the dorsal horn on one side for one artery and the white matter for one side of the spinal cord. The anterior spinal artery, um, if you, it, it supplies, because there's only one, this whole swath bilaterally. And you can further divide it up into a central territory and a peripheral territory. Um, and so if you had a central lesion, you would affect um, motor function only is what the statement at the bottom of that slide means. But for our purposes, anterior spinal, ar spinal artery is the posterior, <laughs> anterior two thirds of the cord. And each posterior spinal artery is a wedge corresponding to ipsilateral gray and white matter. Now I really like this Ken Hub picture because it puts all of those elements together. So you can kind of visualize the whole thing. So here we are in the thoracic spinal cord. That's what's highlighted in green. And I know I'm in the thoracic region because I've got ribs articulating um, with my vertebrae laterally. Um, you can see the aorta uh, anterior to the vertebral bodies. And you can see the sympathetic chain here ascending. And we'll come back to that in the autonomic lecture. So here's the aorta giving rise to segmental arteries, every segment. Um, here is the spinal cord with spinal nerves and ganglia exiting at intervertebral foramen, foramina, if you want to use the plural. And the only thing I don't like about this image is a small, I think it's a, a boo-boo, which is 
here, the anterior ramus travels anteriorly, if you follow the yellow nerve, distal to the DRG, and the posterior ramus travels posteriorly. Most sources put the intercostal nerve, which is here, as a derivative of the anterior ramus. So I think that intercostal nerve should be over here. But nonetheless, if you get this spatial relationship down, you're doing quite well. And then you can translate that to what you see in your book. It kind of looks like this. So this blue segment of spinal cord, every blue horizontal segment of spinal cord contains both gray and white matter, a dorsal root and ventral root, a dorsal root ganglia, um, ventral rami of each nerve that travel anteriorly and in the thoracic levels connections to sympathetic ganglia, which we'll get into in the autonomic session or lecture.